أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to welcome you all back to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad. So we were speaking about <clears throat> the events that led up to the Battle of Badr. In our last episode, we mentioned that when Abu Sufyan received intelligence that the Prophet ﷺ and his companions were planning to raid his caravan, he was able to take a detour and on his return to Mecca, he wanted to ensure that the caravan would be protected from a possible attack. So he sent an envoy to Mecca. He sent an individual by the name of Dhamdham al-Ghifari to basically go to Mecca and to mobilize Quraysh to form an army to come and protect the caravan. And of course, uh, he fabricated a lie that Muhammad and his companions had already attacked the caravan and the wealth and the goods were in danger. We also mentioned that prior to the arrival of Dhamdham in Mecca, about three days before his arrival, the Prophet's aunt, Atika, saw a dream. And the, base, the dream was essentially that there was a crier who had arrived in Mecca and basically said that you are all traitors and you will meet your death in three days. The, call, the crier made this announcement on top of the Kaaba and then climbed uh, the Mount Abu Qubais and also made that announcement and threw a boulder from the top of Mount Abu Qubais which tumbled down to the base of the mountain and it hit every household in Mecca. And the, the fact that the stone, that the boulder hit every house in Mecca was understood to mean that the calamity of death would soon strike every household in Mecca. Now, does this include the family of Abu Lahab? Of course, Abu Lahab is the uncle of the Prophet, and he's also one of the arch enemies of the Prophet. Did Abu Lahab participate in the Battle of Badr? Did he join the army? The historical accounts tell us that Abu Lahab decided not to go and join the army. What he did instead was that he, he sent Al-As ibn Wa'il, who was the, the father of the infamous uh, Amr ibn Al-As, who becomes, later on becomes the right-hand man of Muawiyah. His father owed a debt to Abu Lahab. And Abu Lahab basically told Al-As ibn Wa'il that if you go and participate, if you join the army, I'll forgive your loan. So he owed Abu Lahab about 4,000 dirhams. He said that if you go in my place, I'll forgive the loan. And in this way, Abu Lahab basically had Al-As ibn Wa'il act as his representative and he was able to excuse himself from participating uh, in the Battle of Badr. Now some historians, they argue that Abu Lahab decided not to join the forces of Abu Jahl and the other uh, members of Quraysh because he, f ha he still felt uh, a sense of loyalty to uh, his clan. You know, he still had that Jahili uh, tribalism However, this is unlikely because if you look at the, the life of Abu Lahab, if you look at the way that he treated the Prophet, it's obvious that this man had no problem 
antagonizing the Prophet. And it seems that his hesitancy to join stemmed from cowardice and not from any sense of loyalty to Bani Hashim. And the evidence of this is that he sends another man to do the dirty work. So if it's a, if it's a matter of loyalty, if it's a matter of tribalism, then why would he send someone to attack and potentially uh, uh, kill his nephew and his clansmen? So Abu Lahab, it seems that he was afraid. He was, he's a cowardly man who would rather send someone else to die uh, rather than put himself uh, in any danger. We also find that there are a number of prominent mushrikeen who display some hesitance with respect to joining uh, and heading out to meet the Prophet. One of them, so you have, we have Abu Lahab, which, uh, who we just discussed. We also have Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. Utbah ibn Rabi'ah initially did not want to set out to meet the Prophet, to go and fight, to go and protect uh, the caravan. Now, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, for those of you who don't know, he is the, the father of Hind. And he's the father-in-law of Abu Sufyan. So he's a very well-known personality. But he's also a relative of the Prophet. You know, what's amazing about these stories is that many of these individuals are either directly related or at the very least they're distant relatives. And Utbah ibn Rabi'ah is a distant relative of the Prophet ﷺ. So Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, his thinking was that you know, he did not want to fight his own blood relatives. You know, at the end of the day, this contradicts and goes against the values of the Jahili culture. So he decided that he didn't want to fight. However, his brother Shaiva influenced him and basically essentially shamed him into joining by saying that if we abandon our people at a time such as this, then for the rest of our lives we will have to suffer mockery and humiliation. Shaiva essentially tells his brother that this is not the time for us to sit back. If our caravan is attacked and we don't retaliate, if we don't defend ourselves, we will become the laughing stock of Mecca. Another individual who is also hesitant to join is Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Umayyah ibn Khalaf is the slave owner of Bilal ibn Rabah. And the historical accounts tell us that Umayyah ibn Khalaf was a glutton. He was a man of great wealth. Um, he used to enjoy food and all of the bodily pleasures, but he was not a, a man of war. So he wasn't a fighter. He was more you know, of an eater than a fighter. So, of course with his money, with the wealth that he has, uh, he decides to do something similar to what Abu Lahab did. So when he heard about the, uh, the potential, the possibility of battle, he found someone to represent him. And he paid him you know, a small amount of money. And he announced that this person will represent me in Badr. And Umayyah ibn Khalaf was happy to get out of it. You know, again, this is not someone who is a skilled fighter. At the end of the day, he wants to save his own life. He doesn't want to put himself in danger. But the problem is, Umayyah ibn Khalaf is one of the most prominent leaders in Mecca. And it was important for the morale of the fighters for him to be present. You know, people like Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, people like Abu Jahl. Umayyah ibn Khalaf is, is from that same inner circle. So Abu Jahl approaches Umayyah and he says to him that, listen, if you don't join us, 
it's going to demoralize our army. You are looked up to as a leader. So you have to go. You cannot remain behind. But again, Umayyah ibn Khalaf was still hesitant. You know, at the end of the day, these people understand that there is a possibility of death, especially considering that the, the dream of Atika essentially came true. There was a crier that did arrive in Mecca. So there was this fear of death that lingered in the hearts of many of the leaders of Quraysh. So when Abu Jahl saw that Umayyah ibn Khalaf is not budging, he refuses to join us, he went to Uqba, one of his close friends, and they both devised a tactic to humiliate Umayyah ibn Khalaf and to essentially shame him into coming. One day, Umayyah ibn Khalaf was sitting in public and he was sitting on a fancy rug with you know, some of his aides and his companions and his entourage. And Uqba came to him with what we could call uh, incense. Incense today, some type of perfume. And some uh, narrations mention that he even offered Umayyah ibn Khalaf eyeliner. So basically, he's, he's giving him you know, products that are typically used by women. And he says to him that this is, this is your gift. You know, since, since you want to act like a woman and you want to stay behind, since you don't want to fight, might as well dress like a woman. So Umayyah started to, he quickly understood that you know, remaining behind is going to damage his reputation. He's already, be call, he's be, he's already being called a coward. And for a man at this time to be called a woman, uh, was considered a great insult. So Umayyah ibn Khalaf stood up. He grabbed his sword. He cursed Uqba. And because of these insults, uh, he finally changed his mind and he decided to join uh, the army. Now, if you, what's amazing is that the individuals who end up participating in the Battle of Badr, even the ones who were reluctant. SubhanAllah, the people who were killed in the Battle of Badr are individuals that the Prophet made dua against, especially when the Prophet was in Mecca and you know some of these individuals used to physically assault the Prophet. They used to throw the intestines of a camel on his back when he would pray. Especially when he was in sujood. You know, yanha abdan idha salla, as the Quran said. Have you seen the one who forbids a man when he prays? So the likes of, of Abu Jahal, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, Uqba, these individuals used to torment the Prophet. And when he was in sujood, they would throw you know, blood and the intestines of a camel on his back. So much so that the Prophet ﷺ, of course, Rasulullah did not have permission to retaliate because, you know, during the Meccan period, the, the divine command was for them to remain patient and steadfast. When they threw the intestines of a camel on him, Rasulullah, he raised his hands in dua. And keep in mind that this is in Mecca, this is before the Hijrah. Rasulullah ﷺ, he says, Oh Allah, I leave you to deal with, and then he names, you know, seven or eight people, you know, the likes of Umayyah, Abu Jahal, Uqba, etc. And all of the individuals that he named in that dua were all killed in the Battle of Badr. So even the ones who were reluctant, as we saw, you know, Umayyah was reluctant, but he, he joined. Utbah ibn Rabi'ah wanted to, wanted to remain behind, but again, destiny ha had it that they would all participate. So every single one of them uh, would be among the first to die in the Battle of Badr. So subhanAllah, you know, these individuals, 
they are essentially, without even realizing it, you know, Abu Jahl is preparing, making preparations to join the army, and they're essentially moving towards their death. Now, the Quraysh army. So we have the Muslim army, and we have the Quraysh army. The Quraysh army, of course, is led by Abu Jahl. He is the, the undisputed uh, leader of Quraysh. Narrations tell us that there were approximately 1,300 people under Abu Jahl. They were well-equipped. They, they had over 100 horses, over 600 suits of armor, and 500 camels. And 500 camels is not a small number, brothers and sisters. And these camels were not only used for riding. In fact, they were also used for food. So the narrations tell us that every single day, now when you have 1,300 uh, people, that's a lot of mouths to feed. So some of the camels that they brought with them uh, were reserved for slaughtering so that they could have meals. So they would slaughter about 10 camels a day uh, for food, for sustenance. And, and what's interesting is that before the army of Quraysh arrives, the Prophet ﷺ was asking you know, some of the, the slaves of Quraysh who were advancing uh, towards uh, Bad, the Prophet asked them, how large is the army of uh, Quraysh? They told the Prophet that, Ya Rasulullah, we don't know how, how, uh, how large the, the army is. So the Prophet asked them, how many camels are they slaughtering per day for food? So they told the Prophet, nine or ten. And when they told the Prophet nine or ten, he quickly realized that they must have at least a thousand fighters if they're slaughtering that many camels a day uh, for food. So in addition to the horses, the armor, the weaponry, they also, Quraysh also brought along their singing girls for morale boosting. You know, th this was basically uh, their version of having cheerleaders. You know, so they would bring these women and the women would recite poetry, they would sing. And, you know, if a man wanted to retreat, he would be too embarrassed because, you know, uh, because of the women there. So the women were essentially there to encourage the men to be brave and not to uh, retreat. In Surah Al-Anfal, there's a verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the way that the mushrikeen came out of their homes and were advancing towards the land of Badr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes how arrogant they were, how ostentatiously they came out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Anfal, verse 47, He says, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ خَرَجُوا مِن دِيَارِهِمْ بَطَرًا وَرِئَاءَ النَّاسِ And do not be like those who came forth from their homes insolently. بَطَرًا means insolently or arrogantly and to be seen by people. One of the reasons why Quraysh had assembled such a large army was to, to show the Arabs how powerful they were. Quraysh wanted to flex, you know, as they say. And all of this, you know, keep in mind that in the minds of Quraysh, they are going to protect the caravan of Abu Sufyan. There was no intention for them to, to fight in a battle per se but they assemble this massive army as a show of force to show off to the people. وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ خَرَجُوا مِن دِيَارِهِمْ بَطَرًا وَرِئَاءَ النَّاسِ وَيَصُدُّونَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ بِمَا يَعْمَلُونَ مُحِيطٌ Now, as the army of Quraysh is moving north towards Medina, Abu Sufyan arrives or he gets close to Mecca where he felt that the caravan was safe and it was beyond the reach of the Muslims. 
when Abu Sufyan secures the caravan from any uh, attacks, he sent someone to tell Quraysh, the army that had departed, he sent someone to tell them that the caravan has arrived safely now in Mecca and they can all turn back. So they sent, So he sends word to them that mission accomplished. My fear was that Muhammad and his men would attack our caravan. I was able to find a detour. I made it safely to Mecca. So basically Abu Sufyan sends a message saying, abort mission. We don't need to fight. Mission accomplished. So he tells the messenger, go tell the army to return. You know, at the end of the day, Abu Sufyan is a businessman. And he's not in the war of he's not in the business of war, and we know that war is bad for business. So he says, tell the army to come back. When the messenger of Abu Sufyan arrived, Abu Jahal, Utbah, they reconvened to decide what to do. Utbah ibn Rabi'ah says, let's go back. The caravan is safe. The whole reason why we formed this army, the reason why we marched north is because we were afraid that our caravan would be attacked. Our caravan has now arrived safely, so there's no point in any type of confrontation. And this is where you see the arrogance of Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl had a bone to pick with the Prophet. Abu Jahl says, no, we will go to Badr and we will stay there for three days. We will drink our wine, we'll have our women sing for us, and let the news spread in all of Arabia that we are a nation to be feared. So Abu Jahl was enjoying this show of force. He wanted to send a message to Muhammad, to all of the Bedouin tribes that, listen, we Quraysh are not to be messed with. We'll camp out for three days, and allow everyone to hear how massive our army is, how we are a force to be reckoned with, so as to serve as a deterrent. If anyone dares to challenge us or to threaten us, they know about our military capabilities. So you notice from the conversations between the, the Quraysh, there's no talk of any battle per se. The main objective as we mentioned, was for, to protect the caravan. So, so even though Abu Jahl said to carry on, about 300 to 350 people, consisting mainly of the, the clan of Benu, Benu Zuhra and some of the other small tribes, they returned back to Mecca. So about a fourth of the army decided that there's no point in staying here. The caravan is safe. Let us go back to Mecca. Now, of course, this in and of itself was, uh, was demoralizing. You know, the Meccans lost a fourth of uh, their army. So there is a, a heated debate among the Quraysh. So many of the Quraysh differed about what to do. People, you know, the likes of Abu, Abu Jahl wanted to stay, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah and others, they wanted to go back. Similarly, in the ranks of the Muslims, some of the companions of the Prophet, as we discussed in our previous episode, some of the companions of the Prophet did not want to fight. They told the Prophet that we're not ready for battle. We don't have the weaponry. We don't have the men to fight. So, there were people on both sides who did not want to fight. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He had decreed that this battle is to take place. In fact, the Qur'an mentions that, that even though, that even if the two sides had planned a military confrontation, it would not have happened the way that, that Allah wanted it to happen. Meaning that it was, it was designed, it was decreed that this 
this clash take place. Allah says in Surah Al-Anfal, verse 42, إِذْ أَنْتُمْ بِالْعُدْوَةِ الدُّنْيَا وَهُمْ بِالْعُدْوَةِ الْقُصْوَى وَالرَّكْبُ أَسْفَلَ مِنْكُمْ وَلَوْ تَوَاعَدْتُمْ لَخْتَلَفْتُمْ فِي الْمِيعَادِ Allah says, remember when you were on the near side of the valley and when they were on the farther side and the caravan was lower in position than you, if you had made an appointment to meet, you would, you would have missed the appointment. So we saw that when, during the, the caravan raids, the Muslims kept on missing the Quraysh and vice versa, they kept on missing each other. So when, when they planned to attack the caravans, they would always miss each other. But here, this time, you have both groups not wanting to meet, but Allah makes it happen. You know, this shows us that you know, we plan and Allah plans and Allah is the best of planners. Sometimes we want something to happen desperately, but Allah doesn't allow it to happen. And then when we're reluctant, when we don't expect something to happen, it happens. And then Allah says, وَلَكِنْ لِيَقْضِيَ اللَّهُ أَمْرًا كَانَ مَفْعُولًا لِيَهْلِكَ مَنْ هَلَكَ عَنْ بَيِّنًا But it was so that Allah might accomplish a matter already destined that those who perished through disbelief would perish upon evidence. So there are certain people that have to meet their death. It's the divine decree. These individuals who antagonize, who harass the Prophet, the time of their death is approaching and they are to die in this way, in this battle. Now when the Prophet ﷺ, when he sees that there is enthusiasm among some of his companions, to fight, especially individuals like Sa'ad bin Ma'adh, Miqdad, and others, they expressed their readiness to fight and to sacrifice. So Rasulullah when he sees that he has enough support, there is enough of an appetite to fight, Rasulullah he begins preparations for the war, for the battle. The narrations tell us that the Prophet ﷺ divided his men into three groups. He gave the standard, he gave the main flag, which was white on the on the day of on the in the Battle of Badr, he gave the main flag to Mus'ab ibn Umayr. And we'll speak about the wisdom of the Prophet, why the Prophet did this. You know, everything that the Prophet does is full of wisdom. So he gives the main flag. He makes Mus'ab ibn Umayr the standard bearer on the day of Badr. On the right side, the right flank of the army, he places Ali ibn Abi Talib as the head. And under Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ali ibn Abi Talib is designated as the leader of the Muhajireen. Because the companions of the Prophet they belong to one of these two groups. The Muhajireen, those who emigrated from Mecca to Medina. And then you have the Ansar, the residents of, of Yathrib, of Medina. So Ali ibn Abi Talib is put as the leader. He's assigned to be the leader, the commander of the Muhajireen. On the left side, on the left flank, Sa'ad ibn Ma'adh is given leadership. He's in charge of all of the Ansar. Now, now you may wonder, why is the Prophet dividing his army into these two groups, Muhajireen and the Ansar? Why doesn't the Prophet just mix them? This is where you see the, the hikmah, the wisdom of the Prophet. Many of us, we think that Islam always has a negative outlook on cultural and ethnic divisions. However, we see in the seerah of the Prophet that the Prophet ﷺ, at times, he told his companions to ignore their differences. But there are instances where the Prophet ﷺ took these differences into consideration. So the Prophet ﷺ, he divided his army into the Ansar and the Muhajireen because he knew that it would be, a more, it would be a, more, a more effective strategy. Why? 
because he wanted each group to be comfortable with one another. At the end of the day, we're going into battle. Rasulullah needs everyone to trust each other, to know each other very well. So because the Ansar come from Mecca, they all know each other very well. And the, the Muhajirin are from Mecca, they all know each other very well. The Ansar are from, are from Medina. They're all very well acquainted with one another. So because they felt comfortable with each other, the Prophet ﷺ put them in those groups. What we also see is that, because you know, at the end of the day, he knows that the, the Muhajirin understand each other, they understand each other's tendencies, and he needed his fighters to be comfortable, to be with individuals who, who, they, can, uh, who, can, who they can communicate with, you know, as they say, you know, birds of the same feather flock together. Rasulullah wanted the Ansar to be with each other and the Muhajirin to be with each other. We also see that the Prophet was very careful about who he gave leadership to. The Prophet ﷺ did not just put anyone, did not just assign a leadership position to anybody. He assigns Ali ibn Abi Talib because Ali ibn Abi Talib is the most respected among the Muhajireen. Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad is among the most respected among the Ansar. These are people who are highly respected. So, and this is another important wisdom that we draw from the Prophet, is that if you want to be in a leadership position, if you want to put someone in, in a leadership position, they have to have the trust and the respect of the people that they are leading. So it's not just about competency. It's about competency and also respect. Someone might be competent, but they may not be respected by the people that they are leading. So the Prophet selects individuals who are both competent and respected in their circles. So Ali ibn, Ali ibn Abi Talib is leading the Muhajireen. He's leading the, uh, that flank. Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad is leading the left flank of the Ansar. Now why did the Prophet ﷺ give the main flag to Mus'ab ibn Umayr? Now this again shows the great wisdom of the Prophet. Now the Prophet knows that there still might be some rivalry between the, the Muhajireen and the Ansar. So the person that he appoints to be the flag bearer is someone who is respected by both groups, meaning that he has a connection to both groups. So Mus'ab ibn Umair is a Muhajiri. You know, after all, he's from Quraysh. But he's also among the earliest people to emigrate to Medina. And he's highly respected among the Ansar because... Many of the Ansar converted at his hands. See, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib is a Muhajiri. But Mus'ab ibn Umair is a kind of, a, he, he has this combination. He's a Muhajiri, but he is also kind of like an Ansari because he spent a lot of time with the Ansar and many of them converted at his, at his hands. So to avoid any accusations of favoritism, the Prophet ﷺ makes Mus'ab ibn Umair someone who is, who is respected by both the Ansar and uh, the Muhajireen, who, seem, who seems to be a neutral individual. He is appointed as the, the flag bearer. Now, you may wonder, what is the function of a flag bearer? Why is it that we see, especially in medieval times, we have this this idea, this practice of flag bearing. Now the purpose of a standard bearer, now standard bearer and flag bearer are used uh, interchangeably. The purpose of a standard bearer was to give the fighters on the battlefield a visual signal of where the army was. So it served a logistical purpose. So if in the course of a fight, if a, if a fighter was separated from his unit, 
you could look around and see where the flag is and then you could move closer to the flag. And typically, the standard bearer was in close proximity to the unit leader or to the, to the, the main uh, commander. So it had a very practical purpose. You know, sometimes in the midst of battle, you become disoriented and the flag allows you to kind of recalibrate and readjust yourself to, to rejoin uh, your group. Now, when the standard fell, when the flag would fall, the fighters would lose their visual point to rally around. And when this happened, it would create uh, disarray and chaos. And it typically meant, you know, if the flag bearer collapsed, uh, it typically meant that, uh, that the leader that the leader who had fallen uh, was one of the great uh, fighters of the army. Now, of course, the falling of the flag uh, usually demoralized a military unit and it gave a morale boost to the enemies. Now, of course, the, the flag bearer was especially vulnerable to the attack of the enemies. Now, of course, if the flag bearer is giving a morale boost to his men, naturally the enemy is going to target that person. And what makes it even more difficult is because the flag bearer has to hold the flag, it's very difficult for them to defend themselves. So the Prophet ﷺ, he has to give this responsibility to someone who is incredibly brave and who can fight with one hand. And you know, this is and this is why, for example, in the Battle of Karbala, the flag is given to Abu Fadl al-Abbas. You know, because because Imam al Hussein knows that the flag bearer is going to be the focal point of the attack. You're going to become the main target. So the flag is not given to just anybody. It's typically given to uh, the most one of some of the, the most courageous of fighters. Now the companions erected a special tent for the Prophet. You know, when it was clear that uh, that a battle may very well take place, the Sahaba designate an area where they erect a tent for the Prophet. And they choose an area on the battlefield where the Prophet could see the battlefield very clearly from that vantage point. They wanted to give the Prophet a good view of the battlefield. Now, and of course the tent was also uh, the, the command center and it was the headquarters of the, uh, the army. Now, when night fell, Quraysh was seen on the horizon. And Quraysh arrives late in the evening and it was known that it's very likely that a battle will take place uh, the next morning. Now it's important to note here that the Prophet ﷺ did not used to just sit in his tent and watch the battles. You know, sometimes some Orientalist historians, they have this impression that the Prophet would send his men to the battlefield and he would sit back and watch, that he did not participate. Whereas you find in the, the statements of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, particularly uh, this statement where the Imam says, describing the courage and the valor of the Prophet he says, "Kunna idha hamar al baas, wa laqi al qom al qom, ittaqina bi Rasul Allah, fa ma yakoon ahad aqrab ila al adu min." Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib he says, "When a situation became tense, and when two sides came close to each other in battle, we would seek out the Messenger of God for protection." So when the fighting became intense and we became overwhelmed by our enemies, we would seek refuge with Rasulullah. And there was no one closer to the enemy than him. So in many of the battles, the Prophet ﷺ is actually in the front lines. He's actively fighting. Rasulullah is not just sending 
other people to fight. So the Prophet ﷺ was a military commander who was an active participant in, uh, in many of the battles. So now it's night time. It's the, the night before the battle. The Prophet ﷺ sees that a massive army has arrived uh, on the plains of Bad. He knows that he has a little over 300. He has 313 men with him. The army of Quraysh is over three times larger. So the Prophet ﷺ, he does the best thing a person can do when they're facing insurmountable odds. The Prophet ﷺ, he begins making dua. And he spends the entire night the narration say Rasulullah did not sleep that night. The entire night he was supplicating and he would prolong his sujood. And what was his dua? Among the things that he would say on that night, he would say, Allahumma anjiz li ma wa'attani. Allahumma anjiz li ma wa'attani. Allahumma aati ma wa'attani. Oh Allah, fulfill what you have promised me. Give me what you have promised me. Allahumma in tuhlik hadhi al-isaba min ahl al-islam la tu'bad fil ard. Oh Allah, if you destroy these band, this band of men, if this group dies, you are not going to be worshipped on earth. Meaning you will not be worshipped in the way that you wish to be worshipped. Which is where this Islam is made up of these people. If we are destroyed, Islam is destroyed. So he makes this dua. And the narrations tell us that many of the companions were filled with anxiety, especially when they learned that the army of, of Abu Jahl has over a thousand fighters. You can only imagine. And they're, they're armed to the teeth. Many of the companions were terrified. And this is where you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala show his special rahmah upon the Prophet and his companions. In Surah Al-Anfal verse 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that he does two things on that night to give the Muslims an advantage. So many of the companions, they couldn't sleep, they were afraid. And you ask yourself, if you knew that you had to fight an army that was three times your size, chances are you're probably going to not sleep that night. But Allah says, إِذْ يُغَشِّيكُمُ النُّعَاسِ أَمَنَةً مِّنْ Remember when He, when Allah overwhelmed you with drowsiness, giving security from Him, Allah put them to sleep. وَيُنَزِّلُ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَا أَلِّيُطَهِرَكُمْ بِهِ وَيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمْ رِجْسَ الشَّيْطَانِ And sent down upon you from the sky rain by which to purify you. You know, some of them may have been in a state of janaba And remove from you the evil suggestions of Satan. You know, shaitan was whispering into their hearts. Allah put them to sleep. وَلِيَرْبِطَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ وَيُثَبِّتَ بِهِ الْأَقْدَامِ The light rain that fell on the night before the battle, one of the things that that rain did was so it gave them water for them to you know, perform you know, ghusl if they needed to, but it also made their feet firm on the soil because the plains, the plains of Badr was sand. And it's very difficult to fight on sand because the, the sand is not stable. You can't plant your feet firmly. So that light rain made the soil perfect for the Muslims to plant their feet. And narrations say that on the side of the Quraysh, when they would plant their feet, their feet would sink. It was a lot muddier on their side. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this way He prepares the Muslims for arguably the most important battle 
uh, in Islam. And inshallah, in our next episode, we'll speak about what happened on the morning of Badr and how the battle began and uh, what exactly transpired uh, thereafter. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for uh, tuning in. I look forward to having you join me in uh, for the upcoming episodes of the life of Prophet Muhammad. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Uh, so for this, uh, in this battle, when the Prophet had split the army into three sides, the right side was the Mahajirin, the left side was the Ansar, who was left to be in the middle group? So, so typically the, <clears throat> the middle group was the, the, the main flag. So you have the, the right, the left. So the right was led by Ali ibn Abi Talib. The left was led by Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad. And the center, of course, represented the, the main flag bearer, which is Mus'ab uh, ibn Umayyah. So you have, of course, the Prophet is uh, in the center. And the middle is probably where the, the, two, the two sides meet. And, and um, earlier, when the slaves that were mentioned, who was, were giving the prophet information about like how many camels were being slaughtered, were they slaves that had run away while the army was on the march? It's not clear. The, the narrations say that they, they were slaves of... Uh, of Quraysh, you know, these could have been individuals who were sent to do some errands for Quraysh. Uh, some of them used to be sent, you know, ahead of the army just to kind of, you know, give them a sense of, of what lies ahead. So it seems that these individuals were connected to the, the army, but they didn't really know exactly the details of how many men had gathered. So they could have been sent for errands or just to kind of, you know, uh, to scout the area. Because, you know, you don't want to send over a thousand people in a direction or if you don't know what lies ahead. Uh, it's a little surprising that slaves who might have been sent as scouts are basically informing on their own army to the other person, other side. You know, if, if anything, even if we say that, you know, that they were loyal to Quraysh, at the end of the day, uh, they knew that this information was... If, if, if anything, it would, it would intimidate uh, the Prophet and the Muslims. So they didn't have an exact number, but I think it was very clear to them that Quraysh's army was larger. And even if they don't have the specific count, uh, sharing that information would simply demoralize the Prophet and, uh, and his companions. Yeah, that makes sense. The whole point of the army was to be an intimidation factor. Exactly. And and, and this what the, Abu Jahl. This was the main objective. You know, Abu Abu Jahl knew that Abu Sufyan's caravan was safe and the Muslims would not be able to raid them. But yeah, this was really a show of force, and he wanted it. He wanted to kind of prolong uh, this show of force. And is it established that uh, Abu Lahab did not go to the battle and kind of making Atika's dream not maybe not 100% accurate? Yeah, I mean, I, ha I haven't seen anything uh, that, that would make me doubt that report. We don't have any evidence that he was a participant. We do know that uh, Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, was... Uh, a participant in, in the Battle of Badr, but he was caught as a captive. He was a captive. But Abu Lahab, based on what I've seen, it seems that there is a, a consensus among historians that uh, he was not physically present in Badr. And he, he basically sent an Asa bin Wa'il uh, in his place.